100,000 Rwandans. Innocent men, women, and children, mostly women and children, 80% women and children under the age of 15. When the UN report on genocide, on, on atrocities in the Congo, which just was, was leaked in August and then came out finally on October 1st, it was a, 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 a three-year investigation that was established in 2006, I believe, and completed in 2009, but finally released, leaked in August of 2010. What it says is that RPF, meaning Kagame, possibly committed genocide in the Congo. Now, there's no court that has ruled that genocide has happened in the Congo, so therefore it's not certain that genocide occurred, and we can't say that genocide occurred in the Congo until we actually have a court that rules on that from an official judicial position. But when the Hutus were supposedly committing genocide in Rwanda as early as 1990 or 1991, they were immediately targeted and blamed with genocide by Human Rights Watch. Nobody had to adjudicate the definition of genocide then. The international system wanted to overthrow your, uh, President Juvenal Habyarimana. It did so by using their client in Uganda, Yoweri Museveni, who took power in 1980 to 1986 with Paul Kagame, who then became his director of military intelligence from 1986 or 1985 until 1988. And then Kagame at some point was sent to Fort Leavenworth in Kansas, which is a U.S. Army command and staff college, where he was trained for three months in psychological operations, which means brainwashing, which is what happened to you and me for the most part, unless you you know, really were able to see through the propaganda about what happened in Rwanda. He was trained in psychological operations and counterinsurgency and in battle operations and tactical operations and all these things that were then put into play in Rwanda from 1990 to 1994 with the backing of the Pentagon from Uganda with these kinds of weapons. It was not only the machetes, the weapons and the subject of child soldiers. Here we see two child soldiers for the Sudan Liberation Army. When you talk about child soldiers in Africa, when you hear about child soldiers in Africa, it's always the Lord's Resistance Army, Joseph Kony. All those childs, he's of children, he's abducted. The first African leader or dictator or warlord or citizen or whatever you want to call him to use child soldiers in Africa was Yoweri Museveni in 1980 to 1986. Child soldiers were unknown prior to that. Museveni did this. There's actually a film about this that was produced by a Ugandan man named, I think it's Walter Lapit. And uh, the film shows Museveni bragging, bringing out some children that he's created to become his fighters for the movement that he created and armed and, and they're celebrated as child soldiers and the World Bank didn't care about that and the United States didn't care about that because Museveni was doing what they wanted. And up in the gold of Uganda you had the British attaché for the defense, defense attaché on the left with the South African minerals expert checking the gold samples in a place called Karamojo, Karamajong. Why is the British defense attaché from Uganda checking the gold samples? Now, why is the military guy checking the gold samples? That's the big $20 million or $20 billion or $20 trillion question about mining and militarization in Africa. So there's Joseph Kony, and this is the standard image about what happens in Uganda. It's always this guy, and that's the picture. You'll see it over and over. You'll look closely. Joseph Kony, Joseph Kony, Joseph Kony. Repetition convinces you, conditions the mind to accept the falsities, the, the, the lies, the stereotypes savage Africans eating themselves. Joseph Kony in an article in May 2009 published in Newsweek or Time was acute, was, they said that he, he boiled children and ate them or that his, his group boils children and eats them. They don't boil children and eat them. They don't wear bathroom fixtures backwards into battle like the Mai Mai are said to do in Congo. They don't believe that bullets will not go through them if they wear a faucet around their neck. This is standard racists reporting on Africa. And if you do a little search on Congo from September 96 until December 96, and you look at Newsweek and Time, you'll find articles that talk about these Congolese Mai Mai but warriors ba walking backwards into battle wearing bathroom fixtures, believing that they would not be killed. No mention of these guys, the directors of Barrick Gold, the directors of Banro Corporation, the directors of uh, the companies involved in Uganda, Rwanda, and Congo in the mining sector meeting with Ugandan officials, backing the war in Congo, backing the war in Rwanda, backing the war in Uganda. Who's bored? Anybody? <laughs> so if you want me to stop, I can stop and we can take questions, but I'm just getting warmed up. All right. So here's uh, the border of Uganda and Congo in, two, in, 1990, in 2000. 
And what do you see for sale? First of all, President Museveni in the background, it's, re it's required, I don't see any Coke. It's required that President Museveni, Coca-Cola? Oh yeah, I think I'll have one of those. It's required that, I mean, I've been bicycling all day. Fuck, I'm going to have a fucking Coca-Cola. You got a problem with that? <laughs> so, so there's Museveni. It's required that his portrait is displayed in public spaces. But other than that, you've got Coca-Cola and you've got fancy Coca-Cola. You've got Coca-Cola bottles. You've got special Coca-Cola packaging. You've got special Coca-Cola brochures and even a cooler with Coca-Cola. And what else do you have? Bread, a, 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 a rack of eggs, and a Unilever product. Butter. Butter, butter, butter. Unilever. Butter. Butter, butter, butter. That's it. It's butter. It's margarine. It's actually not butter. It's margarine. And that's what's for sale in this store. The guy's got a few pieces of meat in the cooler, but really, that's it. But what you're supposed to notice here is the juxtaposition of Coca-Cola versus everything else. <clears throat> If you didn't notice that, then you're completely lost, and so am I. So, <laughs> so here's Paul Kagame in his, his class at the uh, Fort Leavenworth, Kansas in 1990. Kagame's on the far right, and I'd love to find out who the other guys are, because I'm quite sure that they're in South Korea, Nicaragua, Chile, Peru, uh, Taiwan, and they're doing what the U.S. wants. Anyway, who are they? But anyway, the most important thing is there's Kagame on the right, a skinny little guy who was sent back to Rwanda to lead the charge on October 1990 into Rwanda, which began on October 1st with the invasion of Byumba in the northern part of Rwanda, in the Volcanoes region. And they marched into Rwanda and started butchering people. They butchered people in the villages, they butchered people across the country, thinking they could quickly take Kigali away from Juvenal Habyarimana, who'd been in power since 1972. Habyarimana was a Hutu. Habyarimana was a fairly ruthless Hutu on a certain level supported by France. And at the same time, Rwanda was considered the Switzerland of Africa. It was developed, it was developing, it was a model of success on many, many, many levels. The U.S. wanted this guy, uh, what, what's the date? 1990, what was going on? Tiananmen Square had fallen, Burma had had its atrocities there where all these students were butchered in Burma with the U.S. knowledge. In Zimbabwe, there were massacres of students. In Nigeria, at the University of Jos, there were massacres of students who thought that Democracy was overtaking the world and they could stand up and protest against the dictatorship that had been in power for all those years. At the University of, Kis at the University of Kisangani in Congo, in Zaire, and at the University of Lumumbashi in Congo, massive student protests that were completely oppressed by the uh, Mobutu's crack forces and completely covered up by Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International who didn't report them. Even though Mobutu was all that, already by 1990, you know, on his way out soon, but still being supported by the power structure on many levels. Anyway, they marched in in 1990, and uh, what, what else was going on in 1990? Coffee prices had just fallen because the IMF had cracked down on Rwanda and forced its structural adjustment programs on Rwanda. Coffee prices had fallen. Educational opportunities for students had declined. All the basic uh, measurements of, of success of a civilization uh, in, declined except child mortality, which went through the roof in Rwanda in 1990, 1989. And then Kagame invaded. And it was covered up by the West because he was a guerrilla force. It was, it was as if they didn't even come from Uganda. There was no mention of that. They just suddenly appeared in Rwanda. They're guerrillas. They're the Jews of Africa, a stateless people. They were backed by communication systems like this built in Uganda. The Pentagon set up big antennas on Idwe Island in, between, in Lake Kivu between Rwanda and Congo when they invaded the Congo. And those antenna systems were later completely wiped off the face of the island. No trace of that today. In the Ruanzori Mountains, in the volcanoes, they set up these communication systems. They had C-130 shipping in troops. This is how the war in Rwanda took place, covert operations. There's a direct connection between Sony and the covert operations image on their CDs. Now, what's the connection? Sony PlayStations rely on columbium tantalite, the raw material that comes out of eastern Congo for our cell phones and our Sony PlayStations. But why the covert operations force on the Sony box of CDs. I mean, what's the connection there? Just a simple militarization of our society where it becomes okay to advertise this kind of ruthlessness as, you know, progress and democracy. No mention of what's going on in Rwanda using covert operations forces. One of the guys that led the charge in Rwanda was Alex Dewal, who also has been leading the charge in Darfur in Sudan. Dewal has been operating out of northern Sudan and uh, I think he was in northern Sudan, but he may be outside of Sudan. But anyway, he wrote the story about, in 1992, started publishing reports with Human Rights Watch and with African Rights about how the Javier Ramana government, who'd been in power since 72, was committing genocide in 
Rwanda. Now, the country was invaded. It was a war of aggression from Uganda. It was invaded by the RPF, the former Ugandan soldiers. They were Ugandan soldiers. They invaded. They were Ugandan citizens. They were Museveni and his people, his generals. Paul Kagame was one of them. They invaded. They started butchering. They started disappearing people. And they started using a tactic that is being used today in Congo, Rwanda, Uganda, Sudan, Somalia, Ethiopia, just about everywhere. And that is, they're called pseudo-operations. Now, these were developed by a guy named Frank Kitson, who was a British military official who operated in Kenya during the Mau Mau Rebellion. Mau Mau is where the, where the uh, media learned its first techniques of psychological operations against the Western public by creating this image of the Mau Mau as these terrorists who are absolutely out to just destroy the white people in Kenya, as if the white people had no, no relationship to the oppression of the Kenyan people for 100 years. The, the pseudo-operations is a tactic where you send in forces disguised as the enemy who commit atrocities that are then blamed on the, blamed on the enemy, and then they slip out, and it justifies the government, in this case Museveni, sending in his, or sorry, Museveni's, yeah, the Museveni government sending in his own troops, or the Kagame government sending in his own troops and committing atrocities. In Uganda, in 1980 to 1986, Museveni's army committed atrocities and blamed them on the Ugandan government who was then persecuted by the American media, Milton Obote, persecuted by the American media, committing a genocide, claiming that the government of Uganda was committing all these atrocities that were actually being committed by Museveni. In Rwanda, it was the RPF committing the atrocities and blaming them on the Habyarimana government. Habyarimana government was castigated as being, and chastised as being responsible for genocide as early as 1992 by Alex DeWall. Alex DeWall is seen all over the media. You'll see him in all these policy journals and all these, the, 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 what's that mag newspaper out of Manhattan that's considered to be left and alternative? The Village Voice, for example. You'll see Alex DeWall just saying whatever he wants and nobody questions it. Alex DeWall and, and uh, Human Rights Watch expert Alison DeForge started producing this story about genocide in Rwanda as early as 1992. And while the RPF was committing the bulk of the atrocities against the Hutu people, 